Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. On this episode of Know How, we're going to be teaching you some premise wiring for、uh, internet lovers, a little bit of augmented reality back with Epson's Muvario glasses. Oh, and、uh, you want to know how to segment your network? We're going to teach you how. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm Father、um, Robert Balliser, and I'm Tricaster set to autoplay. <laughs> <laughs> and for the next 40 to 50 minutes, we're going to be taking you through some of the projects that we've been working on, so that you can geek out on your own.、Uh, first things first, Brian,、mm-hmm. you got a haircut. I did get a haircut. I just noticed that. I had I've had a haircut、I、for、know. like two weeks now, Padre. Or is it the face haircut? Oh, it's the face cut.、Mm-hmm. Face, that was it. That was it. That was. We all look the same to you, don't we? We really, do. you do. I mean, I can't tell the difference. Other hosts, you and Alex, and Leo. It's like, oh, it's the guy.、Right. Uh, you can only tell by our voice. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. It's 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 the cue. That's what I get. <laughs> oh, but seriously, before、mm-hmm. we get into the meat of the episode, there's a little something something that、uh, I've been watching for a while. There's a project going on over at JPL, the Jet Propulsion、yeah. Laboratory. Here, you know, it's in our backyard.、Uh, well, at least part of it, and then. Relative, yeah, yes.、California. We have a very large backyard. Yeah,、uh, that、uh, they've been looking at different ways to explore Mars. That's cool. Yeah, specifically, they want to use a multi rotor. A multi rotor? Not、Is、a that... drone, not a quadcopter. A multi rotor. What's the difference between a multi rotor and anything else that we've so seen? So this just uses two propellers.、Uh, it uses、uh, counter rotating propellers to offset the torque. We talked a little bit about that when、oh, we did helicopters like that.、Right? Yeah, exactly. But but then it's a multi rotor. It has more than one rotor. That's okay. All that it means. Right, right, right. Now the the issue that they have when they they do probes for for Mars is they typically use satellite imagery because we've、mm-hmm. got a couple of satellites that are、uh, uh, circling the, the planet to figure out where they should、mm-hmm. land to get the best. Potential sites for sampling soil and rocks. Okay,、right? yeah.、Makes、But、sense. once you get the rover on the surface of the planet, it's it has limited. It's got a really limited view of what's around it. I mean, you can't get the super fine detail from space that you get from the ground. So, do you really want to risk having your multi-billion-dollar probe land in the middle of this absolute nothingness and then wander around for a year, not、yeah. really knowing where the good stuff is? Right. So then, this would fix the problem of being able to relocate to farther distances. Yeah, yeah. So、uh, the idea is they've they've got a craft that weighs about two point two pounds. So it's it's a kilogram.、Mm-hmm. That、uh, is a multi rotor helicopter that can fly once a day for about two or so minutes.、Huh. It's actually closer to ninety seconds. I like the little crate it has attached. Yeah, to it. it's got to be it's got to be super small <laughs>、yeah. and it's got to be super durable. Now this thing can get enough altitude. And get about 500 meters away from the rover. So the idea is, you get yourself a little bit of elevation. Yeah. You can scan the horizon, get a much better view than you would、right. be able to get from the rover, and then it can figure out where the rover should travel the next day. Oh, so it's like a little scout. It's a scout, right? Oh, that's, that's cool. That's the whole idea. <laughs>、uh, there are some major, major technical hurdles、uh, in flying in Mars. Now, people are going to say, "Oh, there's less gravity, so it's easier, right?"、Uh... And that's true. Uh, But there's also less atmosphere. There's also le- a- less atmosphere, which、right. more, way more than offsets. So the gravity is about what a third of Earth normal. So it's three point seven meters per second squared acceleration due to gravity.、Mm-hmm. On Earth, it's nine point eight, which is good because、yeah. it means that objects aren't going to be held down as much、right. on Mars as they are on Earth. But There's also less than one percent the amount of atmosphere on Mars as there is on Earth, and that's important because the more dense air is. The more propellers bite, right? right? The more lift that they'll generate. Right, right, right. Right. Now we know from our quadcopter episodes that there's a couple of ways to get more lift. The first one is to spin it much faster. Right. And the other way, bigger props. Bigger props. That's basically the only two ways you're going to do it. Either、right. more surface area, so you create more lift, or spin the same propeller faster. There's a limit to how fast you can spin it. We actually, we're going to show you this in the new build. We actually built a quadcopter that spins the props so fast that the edges, they're just squealing. They're no、yeah. longer generating lift. They're just 
cavitating. They're yeah, they're just cutting the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah it's, it's kind really of scary, very loud. actually. Yeah, it's yeah. Kind, of, <laughs> kind, of, kind of creepy. So what they did is they, they went ahead and they made, I think it's, what, 3.6 feet propellers. 3.6, yeah. wow. And remember, this is, is a tiny little device. It's yeah. a tiny little device. Uh, yeah, it's like mylar, basically, because it, it, they don't need them to be really stiff. Right. Uh, because, again, you're working in a very thin atmosphere. Right. And that generates enough lift for this thing to fly, again, close to two minutes, yeah. about 500 meters away from the rover, get up high enough to shoot some pictures, relay them, relay them back to the rover, right. have the rover relay back over to Earth, and then, and then the people on Earth can say, oh, oh, we should be going that way. <laughs> There's something really cool over there. Let's go check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's not the only things that are, are challenging about flying on Mars. The other thing is there's no magnetic field. Remember, Earth has oh, a right. hot spinning core. Right, whereas on Mars, it's... It's, nothing. Uh, it's gone. Yeah, right? it's the gone. magnetosphere is, is toast because it, there is it no... Cooled or, it cooled or there's who knows. There's theories, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 there's, there's actually some great theories. We should probably do an episode on, on just on Mars. But um, Let me finish the Martian first. Let's finish the Martian. Yeah. Oh, yeah, actually, they'll talk about that. Cool. There is no magnetic field, so you, don't, you can't use, like on Earth, we use magnetometers to figure out which way it's pointing, right? Oh, a compass, yeah. Yeah, there is none of that. So <laughs> you... you you can only basically only use images. There's no GPS system on Mars. So you have to be able from the imagery to know, I was heading in that direction yesterday. I want to go three degrees this way. Uh, but I can only do it by what I see, not by any sensors I have. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's fascinating. That, that's a pain in the butt. And the other part is it gets cold. Yes, really, I do know that. Really, really cold. <laughs> uh, the average is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. It gets down to minus 195 at the poles. Whoa. Uh, and electronics just don't work past about minus 30. They, they start, at th weird things start to happen. You start to lose them, especially the batteries. I mean, the batteries are basically fatal at, at, uh, at zero degrees uh, 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 yeah. uh, Fahrenheit. Right. I mean, I've had uh, my motorcycle battery killed because yep. it sat out one night when it was really cold. Yep, yep. And so when you look at this, you need to be able to get enough power from that tiny little solar cell. If you could go back to that, uh, that picture of the, of the mm -hmm. rover, Alex, right at the top of the propeller assembly, that little thing, that's the solar cell. So all oh. the power that this craft needs to generate is coming from that little solar cell. And now that has to create enough power both to give the battery enough power to make it fly for two minutes a day, mm -hmm. but also to keep it warm through the night, because it's going to have to run heaters so that the battery and the electronics don't drop below that fatal point. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So this and is and communicate not easy. back to the rover. <laughs> it's not easy. This. I mean, it sounds easy. It sounds like oh, I could, I could do that. Yeah. yeah I mean, this, this is so. This is what they, they think it will do. Uh, and then remember, there is no radio control on Mars. It's, it's got to have all the logic built into the craft to figure out where it can and cannot land. Because if this thing flops over, that's, there's no one to pick it up. You're done. It's, <laughs> right, right. You've lost Fortunately, uh, the Martian landscape doesn't have any trees, so <laughs> that wouldn't be an issue for me. Yeah. But it does have rocks. It does. Right, so you need to, yeah, like this. You need <laughs> to have a craft that can land hard and stay upright. Bounce, yeah. Right. And so that's what they're doing right now. They're testing this over and over again to make sure that it's going to be able to handle most of the scenarios. They want to be able to use this thing for about a month. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, most of the rovers they manufactured to operate for 90 days, so who knows how long it might actually go. This is actually a mock-up of how the rover would work. What? <laughs> if there were astronauts on Mars? Yeah, just about. <laughs> oh, you don't have to worry about the batteries with that. Right. Oof. But, I mean, when, when you think about this program, uh, aside from that, those wonderful flying machines, the, the advantages are actually huge for the Mars program because mm -hmm. you're already talking about multiple billions for a probe, for, right. for like a rover program, right. this is adding a $30 million ticket. Uh, okay. And it's not a whole lot of weight. Again, it's, it's one kilogram. Right. Um, so if you could add this to an existing rover program mm -hmm. and greatly expand the usability of that rover, it's a win-win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of... Um it gives so much more range to the rover like, really than it, than it yeah. would if it was just sitting there without its little drone scouts that go out and look around at everything. Yeah, because right now, again, as we said, NASA is figuring out where each of their rovers should go based on satellite imagery. Well, satellite imagery is taken from way, way up, right. which doesn't give you the fine detail that you could get from a camera that's on you know, the ground or 100 feet off the ground. Or even that, yeah. Yeah. Cool. There you go. All right. Now, uh, that's all we're going to talk about multi-copters on uh, Mars. But we did want to address a question that has been asked over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. We're kind of reaching back because we covered this way back when we talked about premise wiring here on NOHA. In fact, it was one of the first episodes I did solo 
uh, at the beginning of last year. Yeah. Uh, but, we, but we've had a lot of people say, wait a minute, I, I want to set up a network in my house and I want to do the wiring on my own. How do I do it? So right. some people have said, should I buy a 300 foot cable and uh, run it through my house? And uh, you can do that. Yeah. You can buy yeah, pre-made. You can do that. A little bit messy. We want to give you a better way to do it. Definitely. And right. it looks like you've got the uh, the setup to show us how. Yeah, so Alex, if you go to our overhead, these are all the tools that I use. So I've got, these are my crimpers and my cutters. Uh, and this is a set, an old set of dikes. So all that does is allow me to cut cables. Mm -hmm. These are keystone jacks. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And these are the heads for ethernet cables. This is a coupler. Couplers are always useful because it allows you to connect two cables really quickly in case you want to do some testing. Ah, smart. This is an impact tool, uh, and again, we'll explain what that means. Oh, I know what that's for. Yeah, yeah. And then this is just a tester. Now, this is a nice tester. This yeah, is a this one's expensive, right? This is an expensive tester. Uh, they don't make these anymore, but I, I love these old net tools. These fluke net tools were fantastic. Not only can they do everything from like simple cable testing, but they mm -hmm. could also test the status of a network. That's you don't need this. In fact, you can buy something for you know ten dollars that basically does what we're going to ask of this tool for yeah. this particular episode, but it's nice to have something like this because once you get more advanced, you have more options. Well, yeah, I was going to say, especially for you, because you like to do the network stuff and you like do it do a lot. Yeah. Uh, but maybe if you're you're planning on doing it at your house and then also planning on doing other people's houses for them or something, it might be a good investment. It might be. It's it's just stuff that I like to have in my tool belt. Because you do like your toys. I do like my toys. <laughs> and and also, this it does let you fix so many things that might be wrong with your network. Right. There's so many times where... I'm helping someone troubleshoot over email, over the phone, and they're, I'm like, I just want to say, uh, you know, it, it could just be the wire. Can you just replace, can you easily replace the wire? I right. can easily replace the wire. This is a good way to do it. All right, cool. so here's what we're going to do. We're going to show people how to use the T568B wiring standard. T568B. B. There's a couple of different standards, including T568A. B is the one that almost everybody uses because it was designed for commercial use and everyone's just kind of settled on it. Okay. So, okay. so just the broad broad spectrum. The broad it. spectrum T568B. If okay. you're going to wire to a standard, wire to that one. Okay. Okay, and we're going to explain what that means in a bit. So this is just category 5 cable. This is we had this down in the basement. In fact, this is uh, what is it? Only, uh, this is Cat 5E, so this is good for up to, up to gigabit. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give you a length of cable way short. Uh, I'm using my, my pair of dikes just to, to cut. That's yeah. for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will that's, be that's connecting. I'm going to give you your, in fact, <laughs> I'm giving you the nice set of crimpers, Ooh. so that's yours. All right. Okay, so uh, I'm going to cut myself another little length here. Okay. Uh, we're going to start with how to do a simple cable. So I just want it to look like this store-bought cable right here. I want it to have Ethernet cable in the middle, and I mm -hmm. want to have uh, two heads on either side. Makes sense. So I can connect devices. Now, I would not suggest that you do this... Hmm. to save money because it, this has actually become so cheap you could go to Monoprice and get yourself a box of jumpers. Yeah. But this is always good practice to have because those longer runs that you want a custom length, right. this is a really good way to do it and make sure that you don't have a lot of excess. The worst thing is you get a long run and then you have like a loop. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of sitting and yeah. Well, a long time ago, uh, me and my dad over the summer did a project like this and we ran cable through the house and we wouldn't have been able to do it unless we bought the cables ourselves right. and then cut them and stuff so that we could have the exact length to, you know, the master bedroom, the bedroom, the right. living room, so. Yeah. Uh, so the other part you're gonna need is this, the, the crimpers. This is a really old set of crimpers. I bought this one on <laughs> eBay like 20 years ago. Well, maybe Wait, I, I was like, years. is eBay even around Actually, no. Then? I, you know where I bought this? I bought this at Fry's Electronics. <laughs> like before I entered the priesthood. A brick and mortar? A brick and mortar. This Whoa. is this was like the super cheap $7 model. <laughs> uh, it's this, lasted? This is a nice one. This one, th these kinds of tools are actually going to cost you upwards of like 150 bucks because they have replaceable dies. They're super, super custom. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Very good for crimping. I'm going to let you use those. Or if uh, you have a studio engineer, you could just steal their tools too. Yeah. 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 Hey, Berg. <clears throat> We're coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> and we already took Alex's tools. Yeah, Those yeah, are all yeah. gone. Okay, so uh, 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 in, in addition to this, we're also going to need some heads. If you if you go ahead and, and look at the overhead, these are self-crimping heads. And the reason why they're self-crimping is when I put this into the teeth, of my crimper, mm -hmm. it's actually going to squeeze down those tiny little gold contacts that you see in the head there, yeah. and it's going to make it's going to penetrate through the the insulation of the wire, make contact with the copper, and it it creates a nice firm connection. Okay. So there's eight of those. So this this has eight pieces of copper. 
that are done in pairs. So they're twisted pairs. So right, and they're four colored. twisted pairs. And they're colored. We're going to show you what the colors mean. Okay. All right. Now we need to strip some of the insulation off of this wiring. Right. Because uh, as it is, I, I can't access the... Nope. Uh, yeah. So uh, you can either use these dikes. Mm -hmm. This might actually be easier for you at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, you're going to want to go... I, I, I typically go like an inch and a half down from the top. Half. Okay. And I just... I'm going to use these really cheap ones. I'm just going to make a little score. You don't want to cut all the way through because if you cut all the way through, you're going to be cutting into no, the conductors. I'm a little nervous. And you, you just pull off the edge, and there you go. See? Now you can see the nice little colored strands. The oh. first thing you want to do is check... I'm going to go with the overhead here. I'm check still working on mine. the base of your wires here. You want to make sure you didn't nick any of them. Because if right. you see copper on any of those, it means you've got to start over because you just cut too deep, and you're now cutting into the insulation of the, uh, of the individual conductors. That's bad. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be delicate, but... We'll see. Here, actually, here. So let me let me show you a, a, trick? A, a really cool technique. And this, you have it here. So this one also has a little. Uh, it's got blades on both sides. What if this is all you have? Padre? Then then you're gonna have to learn how to do this. <laughs> the easiest way to do it is don't move the crimper. Yeah. But move the wire. So take this and score the wire. So I, I'm just putting just enough pressure to hold it. Yeah. And you turn the wire so that you cut into the conductor. Okay. And then give it a little tug. And when you give it that tug it's going to strip the insulation so that you can just do that. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Now, in here, there's this, there, all this fuzz. Yeah, if you go to the overhead. That's, that's actually fiberglass. So that, key, that, that gives it strength. So as people are pulling on the cable, it's actually, mm -hmm. it's putting the pressure on that and not on the copper, which is, Smart, you don't want that. You can get rid of that. You don't need that at all. Just cut that yeah. off and we're done. Boop. Boop. So that's yours. Okay. okay. Thank you. So as you can see, inside, I'm going to spread these out for you. That's what she said. Um, <laughs> if you go to the overhead again, uh, I've got a couple of different colors. I've got brown, I've got green, I've got orange, and I've got blue. This is very important. Those mm -hmm. colors are absolutely necessary because I want my, my heads, I want both ends of the cable to match up. Right. So I need to remember the order into which I put them into the plug. Right, that right. makes sense. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have cross connects and weird connects, and that's no good, right? Okay. All right, so the, the T568B standard mm -hmm. states I need to wire white orange, right. orange, white green, blue, white blue, green, white brown, brown. Yeah. That's it right there. And you okay. can find this on Wikipedia. So if you go to Wikipedia and type in T568B, it will give right. you that wiring standard. Now, there's people who are going to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, look at this. White, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green. Why, why would I do that? That's so weird. Shouldn't it do? The reason why we do that, we have that little flip, is it actually reduces the amount of crosstalk that you're going to get in the connector. What's crosstalk? Uh, crosstalk is whenever you have uh, the, and wire mm -hmm. plus signal equals antenna. Right. And you, you're going to be broadcasting signals back and forth. And if you do that enough, you actually decrease the amount of total throughput because there's a lot of interference and there's going to be a lot of retransmissions. Okay. They figured out by splitting that pair, that second pair, you're actually going to reduce the amount of signal crosstalk that you're going to get. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's, it's physics. Yeah. It works. Trust Clever. me. Clever. Yeah. I mean, if, if you want, you can go ahead and create a straight through cable. Yeah. Just, just for you. Just make it, you know, straight the uh, all four pairs straight down. Yeah. Compare the throughput between that and a properly wired cable, and you will notice a difference. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Is there any, um, is there a required length to reduce crosstalk, or does it matter? Uh, well, that's the fun, fun thing. This is actually way too short. Right. Anything about a foot, uh, you don't have enough space for it to complete a, a complete wavelength. Right. And that's bad. You end up with standing waves, and that's not that's not good. Uh, I always say make the ca the cable should be at least five feet. At least, yeah. Okay. Make it five feet, and uh, then there's a maximum limit for depending on how much speed you're trying to push through. Okay. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Sure. But okay, so we know that we want orange. So I'm going to sort this. So we want orange. Then we're going to want start with green, green. then blue, then brown. So blue, yeah, brown. yeah, sort it out like that. Got it. There we go. Then you need to untwist. Now here's the funny thing with untwisting. Yeah. You want to untwist, but you don't want to untwist all the way. The the strength of the pair is by keeping it twisted as much as it can until it gets into the socket. If you untwist it all the way down to the conductor, I mean to yeah. the insulation, <laughs> right. You actually increase the probability of, of interference again. Okay. okay. Well, mine look like they kind of came undone a little bit. Is it okay just to twist it? Yeah, just twist up? it back a little. Twist yeah. It, yeah, exactly. So what we're going to do is uh, look at Brian for a second because he's doing such a good job. He, we're going to untwist the conductors. And remember, we want 
white orange. White so orange. make white orange first, okay. then orange. Then we want white green. White green. Then blue. Then blue, and then white. Then blue. white blue, then green. Remember, that's our little flip. Oh, right. It's like, oh, geez. Class. We're, we're in class. And then we want white, brown, and brown. Yeah. Wait. There we go. How did you do yours over there? And so, yeah, well, I'm going to show you. What I typically do is I'm going to rub it back and forth to try to get them in, in to the, the right rows. And now I look like. White, orange, that. orange. White, green. There we go. Blue. That's the, the this is the proper order. White, blue. Maybe, maybe Alex can zoom in on green. that. Green. Dead center. Yeah. White, brown, brown. Okay. So white, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white, oh. blue, green, white, brown, brown. Okay. Okay. So, and you want that from left to right. Right? You want brown on the left? No. 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 So for, from your left, you want orange over here to brown on your right. Okay, so uh, yeah, left okay. to right, okay. Now you're gonna take the head, and you want, on, when you take the head, you want the, the contacts to be facing you. So not the clip side, this is the clip side. Uh -huh. You want the contact side to be facing you. Okay. All right? Now, if I just put this on like this, you're gonna notice how the, these wires, these conductors will go straight in, but I'm going to have a connector that looks something like that. Uh, I don't want that. I want this, this head to go all the way down to the insulation. Okay. Because there's a, there's a little clip here, right, at the end, that's going to snag onto that, uh, that insulation and it will hold it, will give it strength. Yeah, so mine's going to... That's, that's, yeah, you're going to have issues. <laughs> you're going to have issues there. Uh, and so uh, this, this entire thing yeah. is about, about half an inch. So you're yeah. going to want to take your dikes and snip down to about half an inch of cable. Everything else goes. Okay. okay, we'll just make a little mess here. A little mess. And then I'm going to take my uh, my head here. Uh -huh. I'm just going to insert these. And as long as I got them in the right order, as, when I push, they'll go right into... Uh, you can't really see it. They're, they're, they're right underneath the gold teeth of okay. the head. Okay, yeah. yeah. And so there's two things to check. Make sure, before you crimp, that you've got the right order. So I've got white orange, orange, white green, blue, white blue, green, white, white brown, 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 brown. And you want to make sure that the insulation is in the, the base of the, of the head here. Right. Okay. Now, now that I've got this, I can take this and put it into my, my cheap crimper. See, it's got, a, it's got, this one is right here. On this one, it's right there. It's, it's on the edge. Oh, okay. But when I do this, when I squeeze, it is both pushing down the, the uh, gold teeth of the head and it's squeezing against the insulation so that I, uh, it's going to make nice firm contact. Right. Now, uh, here's the thing. If you, got, if you buy yourself one of these cheap ones, uh, you're going to have to squeeze a couple of times. In fact, what I would suggest is like advance it a little bit and then pull it back and keep crimping because these cheap ones are cheap and right. they don't bite everything at the same time. What's the difference in price between these two crimpers, do you know? Seven bucks. 150 bucks. Whoa. Yeah, so it might be worth for you to squeeze a couple of times. Uh, but I mean, again, this is this is a really nice tool. Uh, and see, this one actually ratchets. It's ratchet. That's ratchet. <laughs> yeah. So what I have now is I have one half of an Ethernet cable. This now has a head on it. This has been properly uh, uh, put, mm -hmm. and then I can I can put one on the edge. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, you keep working on that. I'm going <laughs> to tell people. It's taking me a little bit longer. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. That's, that's what this is for. Once you've got your cable, so I'm just going to cheat. I'm going to use this one. This is where you want to use your tester. So you've got both ends. Uh, this one allows me to actually plug both sides into my tester like this. I don't have to do that. I could actually use, uh, the, where'd that go? I can use this. So this is an endpoint for the tester. I'll put in the overhead. This allows me to hook up to the far end of the cable. And it, it, uh, it will basically loop back the signal so that my tester knows what's going on throughout ah, the cable. Okay. Right. But in this case, I'm going to go ahead and turn this thing on. Let's do the overhead again. So I got my net tool. Woo. And I'm just going to auto test it. And so when I auto test it, it's going to wish it's going to do the wire map. There we go. And it's going to tell me everything is straight through. See, all of my connections go from one to one down to eight to eight. 
And then what's that at the very bottom, the 5H? Does that mean anything? No, not for this. Not oh, for okay. this. Uh, and the, the nice thing about this tester is there's, there's a lot of testers that would just do what's called continuity testing. So this mm -hmm. is just testing the eight conductors and making sure that they go to the eight on the other side, right? Right, makes sense. But if I have a break, this will actually tell me where in the cable there's a break. Like oh, how far away it is yeah, or something? Yeah, because it does an echo back. So tip, when it sends a signal out and it hits a, broke, a broken cable, yeah. it will actually bounce back. And this measures how long hmm. it takes it to bounce back. It will tell you, oh, you've got to break 64 feet okay. in, into the line. That's super, super useful if you're doing premise wiring, like yeah. your house, because now it's just, oh, no, it, I have to rewire it. It's, oh, I've got to break 30 feet in. That's where it goes into the wall. I bet I, I overcrimped. Let's fix right. that right there. Or it got caught on something in the attic and right. got crimped. Right. Okay. Uh, very, very fun tool. Is, I guess that's a good way of testing if you did your, your headpiece exactly. properly. Exactly. So too. if you do your headpieces properly, it should go straight through. And if you didn't, the first thing I would suggest, if, if it's just broken, yeah. is um, actually I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this broken <laughs> so we can... I'm going to deliberately mess myself up for the sake of our audience. You, right. see, how, you see how that works? You, see how that works? <laughs> you, you will have uh, done a correct one and a broken a one before one. I um, have gotten you this know, one that's okay. I've been doing this for years, man. It's all good. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about it. Getting there. But uh, yeah, the, uh, a, a broken connector, whenever mm -hmm. you're making new cables, I would always suspect the crimp first. Yeah. The crimp is probably kind of messed up, and uh, you just need to recrimp it. So, so would you recommend making the cable length that you want with the putting on your heads, and then testing it before you install it? Like you start threading it through the premise? No, no, no. thread it, thread, thread it. it. So assume that the cable that you're running out of your box is going to be good. So, okay. <clears throat> like, we've got this. So this is this is cable that we buy from right. the store. I'm just going to assume it's good. But what I'll typically do is I will run more than one run at a time. I will always run at least two runs through any conduit just because one might break and if it, if it doesn't break I get a spare. Yay. Okay. All right? It's all good. So I'm going to I'm going to deliberately do a couple of things bad to this this side so we can see what it looks like. <laughs> on I the guess tester. you could you could uh, just do the this. wrong order, right? Yeah, I'm doing the wrong yeah. order and I'm going to break one or two of them just to show you what a bad uh, a bad run would look like <laughs> on your <laughs> tester. Or I could just test yours. Bad cable. Don't you do that. <laughs> okay, we go. You, you could test it, but it's not done yet. <laughs> oh, you're getting flack wow, from the TD. Man. Dang, he's all up in your stuff. All right, so <laughs> here we go. Bad cable. Let's run this into the tester. Just, keep, keep going. It's cool, man. It's cool. It's cool. We've got, we got, you know, we've got another 30 minutes in the show. I'm enjoying myself. So man. I'm going to go ahead and retest this thing. Let's get this in the right light. This is a horribly bad cable. We're going to auto test and see what the wire map looks like. Yeah, so. <laughs> uh, so that's bad. Seeing the crosses. Right. So and I've, the, got a busted, and I've got a busted link on three, and then I've got crossed over cables on four, six, seven, eight. And basically, it's because I didn't do, I didn't do the lead over. I went mm -hmm. straight green, straight blue, straight brown. And if you see this, you, it just means, oh, I just screwed up the, uh, the connection in the head. So right. just cut the head off and start over again. <laughs> so buy yourself a big old bag of heads because you're going to need them, especially if you're, you're first starting out. Now, have you ever bought an Ethernet cable that has been pre-made and it yes. was yes. Not yeah, that gets messed properly? properly? Not often. Not often. Not I mean, often. if you buy from a good source, it's not going to happen often. But I have bought every once in a while. I've like it been a need, so I buy one from a local store, and it's, it's bunk. So... Yeah. Uh, my rule of thumbs is before, when I'm doing a premise setup, before anything goes in, I test it. I mm -hmm. don't care if it's straight out of the bag. I will at least do a continuity test because it saves you so much troubleshooting time in the end Yeah. of, I don't understand why this network isn't working. Everything is brand new. Just test it before it goes in and mm -hmm. you're good to go. And what is this? This little guy is called the fluke? Uh, well, no, this comes with it. So, oh, it does come with right, it. Right, okay, so if I did this... Sense. Uh, and, and the reason why they have this is because most of the time you're not going to be able to run both sides. <laughs> right, that the would tester, be right? crazy. Yeah. So this is like on the far end of the house, and I can do my test with this at the far end of the house, and right. it will it will act as if I have the other end plugged back into yeah, my tester. Yeah, it'll, it'll bounce. It back should give me the exact same results in just a sec. It takes a while longer because it's got to bounce them back and forth, and boom, there we go. I've got the exact same results, of, oh, and I only have one side of the cable plugged in. Cool. Okay. I think I've got mine, so now I crimp it, right? <laughs> Well, yeah. Crimp it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use okay. the nice one. You keep working on that, and I'm going to move on to the next part, because okay. making cables is just one part. That's, it's, a, it's an important part, but it's just one part. What we really want 
in order to have a super clean installation are Ooh. keystone jacks. Yeah. Yeah, cuz this is what ge this is what makes your network sexy. Right. And then you can label it like uh you know, master bedroom. Yeah. You know, you know room. this. I yeah. know you know this. There's yeah. nothing quite like ha running out your network and having all your cables everywhere and you're like, "Yes, everything works." And then <laughs> Six months down the line, you need to rewire something and nothing is labeled. Right. And you're just looking at it going, do you see a light? Right. No. Is there a light now? No, is it? Yeah, you I don't uh, want that, right? So when me and my dad did it too, we, uh, we ran some extra cables with the, the thought that like in the yeah. future, we will have more <laughs> ethernet jacks to plug in and stuff. And then we didn't label where they went. <laughs> so we have these empty keystones. And like, I don't, I, I don't, don't know which know. cable what? goes to where. It's going to be a headache to figure it out. Uh, yeah, exactly. And that's why we've got this. So this is a patch panel. This would, l let's say your wiring closet is in the garage. Mm -hmm. And let's say you've got like four of these. So each of these is, tw is 24 ports. Uh, and uh, so you've got, what, 40, 96 ports, Ooh. right? Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. I like that. Um, you could label each one. You could have documentation to show you, okay, this one goes to the, these four are for the bedroom. Right. And these two are for the kitchen. And these three are for the TV room, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Just go down the line, make sure you, uh, you, you label each one as it goes. But then on the other side, I have another jack. And this is what's called a keystone. And the reason why yeah. it's called a keystone is there are wall mounts and uh, wall plates that will just accept these. I'll just, I can just plug it in and it will be flush with the plate. Snaps in, yeah. And the nice thing about that system is that you can, you can get multiple keystones. So you can get them from ethernet jacks, you could get them for coaxial cables if you're running cable, you could get them for fiber if you're running like a toss link uh, for, um, uh, for your audio system. Mm -hmm. well, basically anything that says keystone will fit into the keystone system. Makes sense. All right. Uh, wiring these are slightly different. This is where we're going to use the impact tool. Uh, how you, how you doing there with that wire? Uh, I'm working on my second one because I, I want to test out my All right. setup. Good stuff. Okay, while you're still working on that, I, okay. I've got this pre-wired one because, you know, I didn't want the audience to wait. <laughs> I'm going to use position number two here, right here. So I've got something in position number one. Position number two is down below. Uh, As you okay. can see, uh, again, this is a, a 568B wiring standard. I've got blue, orange, green, and brown. Now, always check the manual of your patch panel to make sure you're wiring it properly. But in this particular case, it's going to go white, blue, blue, white, orange, orange, white, green, green, white, brown, brown. But that's different than... It's different, but it will end up the same on the other side. Oh, uh, okay. okay that's, why, that's why you have to... Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and cut myself... Oh, actually, I've got this. This will, this, what you got there? I'm pretty sure, yeah, this is busted, so this should turn out completely <laughs> wrong. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and uh, give myself a little snip here, like so. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to strip the wire just like I would if I was doing a, a standard Ethernet cable, like, like you're doing right now. Right. Uh, and so. I'm going to go ahead and cut off the insulation uh, uh, like we did before, the little fiberglass strands. Right. And I'm going to spread my wires so that they'll match up with, uh, with the wiring diagram here, which again starts blue orange, green, and brown. And there's no twist. It's going to do the twist for me inside. Right, right, right. The wiring is doing the twist. So I go blue, orange, green, and brown. So I'm going to be like that. But I want, I want this on the inside because I'm going to, I want my wiring to be neat so all the wires are in the inside channel and not on the outside. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and, and uh, untwist my wires again. And again, the, the same rules apply. You want to try to keep as much of it twisted as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, because the more you untwist it, the more susceptible it becomes to interference. And interference is not your friend. No. And so, like this patch panel and stuff, I guess, where would you get all this? Uh, you can, I mean, you buy this, this hardware online. store. You get it on Amazon. Amazon. It, it, it ain't nothing but a thing. Everybody has these, and everybody has their own personal favorites. Personally, I like the patch panels that have keystones rather than these dedicated ports, because it means I can just terminate into these and then plug them in. Uh, I see. Yeah, it, it, it saves me time. But these, these tend to be a little bit cheaper because you don't have to buy a bunch of keystone jacks. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna okay. go ahead and wire this in. White, blue, blue, white, orange, orange, white, green, green, white, brown, brown. Oh, this is so jank. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't ever do this on TV. All right, so <laughs> that's what it's going to look like. 
the, I'm not done yet. So all I've done is I've gone ahead and put these in the right position, but now I need to use this impact tool. Now, Brian, uh, yes. a little something, something about impact tools. Uh -huh. uh, they have blades. Those blades can be adjusted for what you need. So for example, like depending on the gauge of the wire? Depending on the gauge of the wire, depending what you want to do with it. This blade has two sides. On one side, you'll see it, uh, go to the overhead, uh, you'll see that it's completely flat. There's no, there's no cut on that, right? Yeah. Go to the other side, there's a slight blade, that, that side that's longer. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, this is the one I'm typically going to want to use because it will impact and cut the excess at the same time. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to make sure that I have that in my tool. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, very important, the blade goes to the outside. If you put the blade on the inside, then you're cutting through the connector you want. <laughs> okay. And I say that from experience. I've done that. Yes. <laughs> so don't pay attention. Ever, don't ever do premise wiring when you're sleep deprived. All right. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is the blade, here we go, goes on the outside like that. And I'm just going to give it a nice, I'm going to put it into the groove and give it a nice impact. There we go. And you just go right down the line and just keep going. I like to give it a couple because, especially since this is a super cheap impact tool and not the most expensive patch panel, uh, I don't always trust that it's cut all the way through the insulation. Because just like with the heads, there are actually teeth inside of here, and when you impact it, it they're supposed to cut through the insulation to be able to uh, make contact with the copper. That's cool. Uh, so it, when you push down, it kind of pops in? And... Right, so there's, like, there's two teeth, there's a V. And as you push down, it pushes the copper into the V, and it will cut through the insulation and make contact with the copper. Ah, okay. It should actually cut a little bit into the copper to make that really strong. Okay, okay. makes sense. So now I've got uh, I've got this in two, and I've got this jack here in one. I'm going to test the jack. So the the idea is, uh, I I would use the keystone jack to have the other side. So this is the side that's actually in the bedroom, and keystone right. jacks look just like this. So this is a brand new one. And it looks exactly like that patch panel that we just did. It's got a bunch of channels into which we put the wires, and then we use the impact tool to terminate to the wires. It. Yeah. Right. So okay. um, we're not going to show that again because it's the exact same, the exact same, same thing. process, just different, different little holster. Right. right. Now, okay. now this is how we would test it. We would take our little fluke thing, the fluke, and we would put it remote. So we have, let's, we've got a partner on the other side, right? Right, right? And we're like, okay, go ahead and plug it into jack 1A. And so they would put this in the jack 1A. I'd have my tester on the remote side, like again, in my wiring closet in the garage. And I would plug my tester into port 1A. There mm -hmm. we go. And now I should be able to do a, uh, an auto test of this thing. So right now it's firing signals down the line mm -hmm. against this, uh, this, this jack here, to against this port. To the fluke, to the little fluke tester thing. And the, then the it's loop sending the signal back, and then it's going to tell us if there's any right. interference. And so when I check it, it'll show me, oh, nope, it's straight through. And cool. straight through is good. So I've got a clean connection between port one and this jack. You want to do that for the entire network. Okay. Uh, because you want to make sure that you don't have cross connects. You want to make sure you don't have broken connections. This is where a more advanced tester does fit in really, really nicely because, right. again, it will tell me if there's a break. If the break is like at zero feet or 300 feet, I know it's on either end, yeah. I'm good, that's fine. I, I can just re-terminate. Right. If the break is like halfway through the run, I go, damn, yeah. it's gotta, re, gotta just rerun that, Redo. I can't fix that. I can see that coming in really handy for, like when uh, we did my parents' house, uh, we ran the cable to what we thought was, we thought we were running the cable to the master bedroom, and then when we would plug it in, it's like, we're not getting any connection, and we had to kind of like, we're like, oh, no, 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 we got the cables mixed up. Like, we have to move the keystone to this one, you know, switch them around. We got them switched around, and we couldn't figure out why we weren't getting a uh, connection yeah. to the, the one of the bedrooms. Oh, we've got some really good comments in the chat room. PC Guy is, is mentioning that there are jacks out there that don't require punch-down tools. In fact, you could do oh. it with this one. You just put the wires into the right slots, and then you use the cap, and you push it down. Oh, uh, okay. I don't like those. Uh, those... They're always hit and miss. I like yeah. having an impact tool. I, again, that's just me. I'm kind of old-fashioned. But uh, <laughs> this gives me positive feedback that I, it's actually gone down, and it will cut off the excess, which makes it nice and neat. We've got an, another person in, um, is, oh, yeah, Sandstrom, 
who's saying that these punch down jacks are a pain if you don't have enough slack. That's absolutely, uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Something I should mention. <clears throat> I always give myself what's called a service loop. So I run as much wire as I need. Yeah. And I will like leave three feet of slack. Just to like, in case you make a mistake. In or case something? I make a mistake, or but also because if you don't give yourself enough slack, you're like terminating this, and it's inside the wall. Oh god, yeah, that would be a that's, pain. That's a pain. So give yourself a, just a little bit of a service loop, something that you can shove back into the wall or into the into the wall mount. Yeah. Uh, you know, if if I'm really pressed for space, I'll make my service loop six inches. But at right. least give yourself enough where you can make one or two mistakes without having to rerun the entire thing, because that's a yeah. pain. Don't don't measure exactly the amount that you need. Right. Do a little extra. A little, okay. little extra. And, and actually, what I, <laughs> I cheat sometimes. Uh, there's There's been installations where we actually have the walls out. Yeah. Uh, like, we just redid my family home in Fremont. And we'll leave little pieces of slack in between the, the connection joints as it's running through the house uh -huh. so that if we really need it, we can pull on it <laughs> and then get an extra 8 inches, 12 inches. It's, uh, yeah. Nice. It, you shouldn't do that, but I no. do it because, you know, well, I, I know things are going to happen. You know your family better than anyone else. So. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, so this, this is, in a nutshell, this is what premise wiring is all about. Premise wiring is repetitive. It's incredibly repetitive. You're going to use the same skills we, we just showed you mm -hmm. over and over again. But the rewards are incredible. If you're going to be in that house or in that office for any amount of time, there's nothing like having a custom-made network. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's fun, and uh, I think I got better at doing this one. We'll see. It was, this one went a little bit easier than the first one, so okay. we'll see how my cable. Yeah, went. We're, we're coming to the end here, so we're going to go ahead and uh, see how Cranky Hippo did. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> this is <laughs> the, uh, my the network. Uh, the judgmental tester here. This this tells no lies. It has no bias. Okay, wait, well, let me just okay, do one right. real quick. Okay. Why did water just shoot out of it? <laughs> <laughs> it went in my cup. Hold on. Now, is water bad for network cables? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is, is it okay to plug it in there yeah, if it's, it's wet? It's fine. It, 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 we might, right. I, you know, I've never done this before. Let's see. It might explode. <laughs> All right. So this is the hippo. This is the hippo cable. Well, I should not keep my water cup so close. Go. Oh, you know, you know what helps sometimes when What's you do that? it? You have to crimp all the way. <laughs> Did I not crimp it all the way? Yeah. It's just. That's okay. Mm. It's okay. You know what? It, it's cool, man. It's cool. I Are still, they both I still not crimped you. all the way? I still respect you. Don't worry wow, about it. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> that means a lot now. All right. Here we, oh, and yeah, that's wet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, let's go. send a signal to Here we though. go. Okay, uh, I'm hands off. I'm not trying to modify the test results at all. <laughs> That's pretty close, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the water. The water probably uh, did not help that situation. <laughs> So, practice! So, yeah, you, get, you need to come <laughs> over and help me practice. with my network. Uh, <laughs> you know, one out of eight ain't, ain't bad. This is pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It also, right. Yeah, that's bad. <laughs> now, we are going to do some future episodes on some advanced premise wiring because there are a couple of tricks for when you want to start doing things like this. This mm -hmm. is freaking monster cable. This is actually what I ran in the house at Fremont. Why is it so thick? Uh, this thing can do 10 gig over Ooh. distance. Uh, and believe it or not, 10 gig may sound ridiculous right now, but it's not because 802.11ac, what's called Wave 2 devices, yeah. are coming in now. And those can do 7 gigabits per second per wireless connection, which Ooh. means you need to be able to give it enough speed to the access point. Right. Uh, so when those start coming in, I mean, that's why we, we did this in our house because we wanted to future-proof it. This is difficult to terminate. It, it's, it's much less tolerant of doing things like untwisted pairs. And there's actually, if you look in the middle here, there's like shielding, there's like a cross beam that keeps the pairs separated oh, yeah. inside the, the cable. Yeah, that um, looks serious. Yeah, it's, it's serious stuff. Hmm. Yeah. So you're saying if I ever do mess with that, I need to practice a little bit more. Probably a bit that, more than one of the eight. The Cat5. Although I do like that, I've never seen this where, mm -hmm. see, normally when you have a cross, you have a cross all the way across. <laughs> You've actually managed to cross at the connector. And mm. I, didn't, I, mean, that's, hey, that's, I, I was that's just trying different. to do a test study. <laughs> yeah. hey, hey, Padre, can we see yours in the tester again? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, okay, so, folks, this this is what uh, a proper a proper one looks like. Where, where did mine go? Oh, yeah, you got to oh, find oh, wait, it there, first. Okay. So this is what it looks like when you... Um, do it properly? Well, when you only take 
45 seconds to make the cable. Uh, it should look like... I spent entirely too much run. time trying to, to do this. It's, you know, no, it's cool, man. It's, seriously, it's, it's all about practice. Okay, so that's what it should look like. <laughs> that was pretty close to that, that right? Yeah, well, you got that part. You got that part. Yeah. All right, uh, now... We, uh, <laughs> I'm going to diagnose this We're later. having fun with this. We're going to diagnose a little bit. But uh, uh, now is the time for us to take a quick look at something else at CES that I yeah. thought was pretty cool. Last week, we took a look at Epson's Movario AR. That's cool augmented stuff. reality glasses. And I talked about some of the different things that people were doing with them. Like, for example, letting you steer your quadcopter with them. Well, uh, there's a company called Lightshot that has a different idea of what you do with AR. Hey, uh, Alex. Go ahead and push that magic button. I played a lot, a lot of Ingress over the last couple of years. It's a game that Google put out. It's sort of a, well, VR slash AR, but you have to play with your phone. You have to be scaring, staring at your screen, setting off bursters, setting up shields, capturing portals. It's fun. But wouldn't it be nice if you could put on a set of glasses and just see the world of Ingress? Well, that's what they're trying to do here at Lightshot. I'm standing next to Tom, who kicked off a wonderful program with Kickstarter to create an alternate, oh, sorry, an, an, an augmented reality gaming environment. Tell me what this is. So what we have here is the Lightshot platform, which is an infrared transmitter and an infrared receiver that are paired using Bluetooth LE to your phone. So something very similar to, say, a laser tag. Except now you can do much more advanced gameplay. And what we're demonstrating here is a game called Assassin, which is based on the classic game that people have played on college campuses for a long time with Nerf guns. And it normally required a ref and somebody to keep track of all the rules. And in our case, it's all automated. So in this game, you would take a selfie. You're playing with three, four, five of your friends. You guys start up the game, and each of you is assigned another player that you're trying to hunt down and shoot with the lighter, the infrared uh, beam. And you're all wearing the light puck, which is the sensor. And so you have a limited amount of time in which you can complete your mission. If you complete the mission, you're assigned a new target, and the timer resets, and the game continues until there's only one player left. And this was just a simple example of the power of the things that you can do once you start connecting the Internet of Things to gaming. And we're very excited about all the various possibilities. This is just the first of many games that we're working on, and it's going to be an open platform. So other people can make games for our system, people can modify the hardware. And our Kickstarter started just a couple days ago, so you can now actually order the hardware, and we'll be shipping it in Q3 of this year. Now, one of the things that people need to, to realize about this is that you're not making a game. You, you've made a game, but you're really building a platform. You're building a framework that other devs can use to build up their fantasy environment. Uh, in fact, Google could come in and say, you know what, we're now going to enable ingress so that you see the portals in the glasses as you walk past them. That's what I love about this technology. Now, now tell me, what's the challenge of using something like the Muverio from Epson to create your AR game? What's the most difficult thing to do? I think the most difficult thing to do that people don't realize is when you're using something like on a monitor, you're displaying a full screen. And so you need to be very cognizant of the fact that people are looking through the glasses. And so there's a lot of things going on in the real world that they need to pay attention to. So you need to display a limited amount of information for the player, only what is necessary as opposed to trying to display everything to them. So in the case of Assassin, all we have is there's a compass style at the bottom of the screen that's telling you the range uh, and direction that your opponent is in. There's a timer in the top right hand corner that's telling you how much time you have left to complete your mission and when you eliminate your target you'll be assigned a new target you'll see that in the glasses as well but we're trying to you know, minimize the information display we're trying to copy it off something like a heads-up display from a fighter jet so that you can run around see what's going on in the real world while you're getting the data that's relevant to you in the glasses I don't know how you did this but my glasses are telling me that I have to shoot Karsten which kudos very well done okay now let's get real we know that you had a f phenomenal Kickstarter, but what needs to happen next? You need developers, you need talented people to come in and design things like wands so that people can fight in, the, in a Harry Potter-esque type world. What do you want to see this do in 2016? What we really want to see is we want to get people playing mobile games in general, interacting with other people in the real world, and not sitting down staring at their phone. So if I can get people to play games and interact with the world around them in various ways, then I think that that's been a success for us. And that's really what we're trying to do here. 
My background has been in console development, where everything is always a secret. I can't talk about it with anybody. You got to get approval. And with that, we were sort of rebelling against that with our product. So anybody can make any kind of game that they want for our system. They don't have to get permission from us. You can host your own game. You don't need to ever talk to us. Or if you want to host your game server on our platform, then you could pay us a small fee for hosting it, and you can run your own games. If you buy the hardware, we're going to give you the STL files for all the peripherals. There's an Arduino inside, so you can modify the hardware, make it do whatever you want. Now, big question, pricing, availability, availability where do they go if they want to find out more about LightShot? So you can go to www.lightshot.com, L-Y-T-E-S-H-O-T.com, and you can find out more about our product. That also has a link to our Kickstarter, which just went live a couple days ago. We've been working very hard for several years on this product. The hardware development has been done, and we're really trying to get people to just adopt the product, and we'll be shipping the hardware to people in Q3 this year. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you for showing off your, your, your wonderful dream for, for AR. And uh, until next time, remember, light shot. I'll have one. Get in the game. That's cool. What are you doing with Network that? Networkum expelliamus. God, you're uh, a dork. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's, that's I mean, uh, the gun game is kind of cool. But yeah. I love this idea. He actually showed me the mock-up of it would track your movements. It would track the movements of your wand so that you would have to do the right <laughs> combination of movements in order to make the spell. I mean, that, come okay. on, that's like, that's All LARPing. Right. That's LARPing in real world. Yes. Right? Expelliarmus. <laughs> What's that? Semper Leviosa. Semper I can't remember all the spells. I'm sorry, it's been a while since Potter I SJ. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's just the start of what we're going to have with the AI revolution. Now, remember, we, we filmed all that before Microsoft made their announcements of mm -hmm. the cr incredible HoloLenses. But it's the same kind of technology, which is if you can track what's going on in the real world and map it onto some sort of virtual uh, layer, you, the possibilities are endless. I mean, it's yeah. not just video games, but of course, a lot of things start with video games. That's what drives the profit margin. Yeah. And then you start having things like real life CAD. I mean, can you imagine if I could take this mug <laughs> and it would see the mug and then I could like, I could like, you know, do this and I start adding things to the mug, just yeah. with my fingers, and then have that go straight to a 3D printer. Yeah, I, I think even it was the Microsoft uh, commercial for their stuff where it was like Minecraft, and they were like, you know, building yeah. the world on their coffee table. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I like to liken it to remember Minesweeper. Well, okay, <laughs> yes, I do know Minesweeper. Yeah, but but like when I was when I w back in the day, <laughs> they had computers then. They had these wonderful computation machines. <laughs> uh, well, but uh, Minesweeper and Hearts. Or solitaire. Oh yeah, solitaire. Were the things that train people how to use the mouse interface. And the, yeah, those were games. Those and were those games. Were... But people learned that oh, when I move the mouse here, this happens. When I move the mouse right. there, that happens. And then Counter Strike came out. And then Counter Strike <laughs> came out. And so this is the same sort of thing. AR is great technology, and people are going to say, well, why why do games? You could do much greater things. But when you do the games, you learn how to use the tech. Mm -hmm. And once you learn how to use the tech, that's when it becomes productive. Hmm. And the, Jason Clanthus bought the the Samsung VR goggles. Right. First thing I wanted to do was play games with it. Yeah. So <laughs> I can't I can't use those. I, the, anything that's VR, I get nauseous really quickly. Oh no. There, it's, I don't know. My brain just goes, this is not real. This is not real. <laughs> no, stop. This is not real. Maybe you need to do VR Minesweeper. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for me, AR is much better because yeah. I actually see, like, I get right. the cues. Well, I'm looking at you, and now there's pop-ups next to you of this is your co-host. <laughs> you can't get network cables. In know. case you ever forget. Yeah, thank you. In case you can't remember my name or something. Right. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, we're going to see more of that. Now, I believe in the next episode, we're moving away from AR. We do want to show you a few more things from CES. Uh, they're going to be pretty dang cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. stuff we've already seen has been pretty dang cool, so I'm excited. All right. Now, we know that this is a lot of a lot of material, especially all the premise wiring stuff. There's been people in the chat room who are absolutely fantastic. They've been giving beginners some uh, some clues. And yeah, some yeah. A lot like, of talk of Cat7 in there. Cat7, yeah. Cat. <sighs> Yeah. Fast, fast stuff. <laughs> uh, but we've got people who are saying, you know, don't don't ever crimp your own jumpers. Go ahead and buy those. I would actually give you that advice. It's it's good to know how to crimp it, but mm -hmm. I, I would never spend the time crimping like 40 cables just so I could patch things in. I would oh, just yeah. buy for $25 all the cables I need. It's it's, it's not worth my time. Right. Um, and you know, other people are saying, always run two. 
just like I said, always run two. In fact, I, I typically run like four cables. Just in case. Just in case. And also, it's not like I'm not going to use them. Yeah. I, I, I'm at the point where I always want to plug things in. And if I, if I don't have to put a switch on the far end, mm -hmm. because I've got enough ports on the far end to get me back into my main switch, of course I'm going to do that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, so always future-proof. Whenever you're running premise wiring, it is so much easier to, to overdo it now than redo it later. Yes, save yourself some time. And the thing yeah. I really want to do, if I redo it now, because it's been, I think we we did it at my house when uh, the first Xbox came out. So what was that, 2001? Yeah. Uh, so it's been a while. Uh, I want to do it where I wire to um, wireless hubs in the ceiling, mm -hmm. kind of like a fire um, fire alarm, and then just be able to like have wireless signals through the house like that. I, I, I should have taken video when we uh, redid the house in Fremont, because mm -hmm. they literally, we took out all the drywall. All the drywall is out. Dang. Um, and we had access to everything. So <laughs> there's about a mile and a half of cable. I had a, I had a, I had a deal from an old warehouse that I used to work with, and they yeah. gave me all their their Cat Seven cable, nice. the big old stranded stuff. So there, there was cable everywhere in places that we we'd have nothing there. We have no plans to have anything just there. Just in case. Just in that case. That sounds like the ideal situation. Yeah. Like where you have no walls as barriers for getting threading exactly. the cables and stuff. One. Thing. I, we shouldn't be doing this at the very end, but one right. thing I will say, <laughs> if you are running premise wiring and this is for your home, spend a little bit of extra money and make sure you get the plenum. Plenum? Plenum cable. Because So plenum, what it will happen is if there's a fire, it will actually melt and basically seal itself so that the fire doesn't continue through any holes that you've made for the cable. It's, you know, oh. It doesn't help a whole lot, but it helps just enough where you could stop a fire from, before from it spreads. From spreading right. from, along the cable to another room well, or something? Like people will be cutting up between baseboards and stuff, yeah. and the fire will go straight through that. So if you have plenum cable, it will actually plug the hole oh. and, and give you just a little extra time before the fire spreads through. And is it is it much more expensive? It is. Oh, it is. It is. <laughs> I, I know. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and and, and the, the, the truth is a lot of people don't use plenum. Um, yeah, but I always do because that's how I was trained to. I will pay the little extra. Yeah. Uh, you can do premise wiring with non-plenum, but I would not suggest it. Right. Okay. In fact, it will not be up to code. So. Oh, okay. Well, then just, there's that. Just FYI. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, if you want any of our notes so that we'll, you, we can show you exactly what we did and we can show you where we bought our parts and, and uh, you know, the procedure we followed, you can always go to our show notes page, which, uh, Brian, where, where is that thing? Twit.tv slash KH. Uh, all our prior episodes are there, too. And, ex yeah, especially after this episode, you're going to want to run through the, uh, the show notes. And you know what? I'm probably going to have to look through the show notes so I can get my network cable right the next time. Uh, there's also links to subscribe or download uh, whichever video or audio version of your pleasure. You know? Yeah, do it. Do it. That's what we do. That's what I we mean, do. We make it easy for you to well, watch I the have, show. I have 47,000 devices that download our <laughs> podcast every week. <laughs> I was wondering how we were getting... <laughs> we, we have like 46,995 <laughs> downloads. Yeah. Okay. Also, don't forget that if you want to talk to the wonderful people in the chat room, because mm -hmm. they, actually they've got some great tips. Uh, you should be yes. watching live right now, and you should be in the chat room so that you can see what they're saying. Yes. But you could get some of their wisdom by going to our Google Plus group. Just go to, to, go to Google Plus and, and look for the know-how group. We've got over 8,000 people in there, and they cover topics, everything from networking to quadcopters to how do I program a Raspi or an Arduino. Right, showing off their projects and stuff, showing us up with their projects. Yeah. Don't like that. <laughs> Actually, we do like that. That is cool. Yeah. Uh, now, if you're not in the Google+, Plus, you could also follow us on Twitter. That's a, a, that's a fantastic place to suggest topics for new shows. You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. And I am at Cranky underscore Hippo. And if you want to know where more of the behind-the-scenes stuff happens, follow Alex. That's right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Alex is shy, but remember, he's A-N-E-L-F-3. Follow him, and you can see what he does with Minesweeper. Wait, oh, oh, careful. Wait, wait, no, 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 wait. Oh, that one? Oh, <laughs> you sank my minesweeper. Minesweeper. Yeah. Hmm. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasare. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how, go do it. Shoot. <laughs> blah, 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 blah.